Show. This is the John Bassler Show. The eve of the beginning of the impeachment inquiry in public by the Democratic majority of the House of Representatives. Michael Vlahos, an historian at Johns Hopkins, joins. Michael and I, for some years now, have been entertaining the possibility that we are involved in a civil war in the United States. Red and blue, urban and rural, nationalist and globalist. There are other ways to divide up, but if you stated the two parties or the two silos in the United States, the 2016 election is an illustration. The 2020 election is less than a year away. We look now at the presentation by the Democratic majority in the House, because the Republicans enjoy majority in the Senate, to present the case that Donald Trump is illegitimate and that Donald Trump must be removed an empty chair before the 2020 election. Michael, a very good evening to you. We've talked for several weeks now about this march towards what is called impeachment. But because you and I read history over the last 2,000 years, I think the better word would be regicide. We're looking at removing the king. By removing the king, disorder follows. The instances in these last several hundred years come to mind. That would be Charles I during the turmoil of Britain, of England in the 17th century. That would be Louis XVI in the turmoil in the 18th century, coterminous with the birth of the United States. And that would be the Tsar. That would be the early 20th century that begins a a century of turmoil and tragedy and mass murder, the 20th century. This regicide doesn't promise at this point to be bloody-minded, but then again, neither did all the three instances before. They were seen at the time as an end to a story, not the beginning of a tragedy. Good evening to you, Michael. Good evening, John. Um, And your metaphor is very apt in one sense. It's apposite, as they say, but it's also tremendously troubling in the sense that the uh, regicides that you raised, you know, in the English Civil War, in the French Revolution, in the upheaval after the Russian revolutions and civil wars, uh, all of those revolved around complete replacement of the ancien regime as the french called it and the you know assertion of something completely new uh but the uh really worrisome aspect of the situation we're in today is that the democrats propose to cap their four year or what will be a four year effort to overthrow this presidency with some sort of um, uh, banner, you know, some sort of public banner that this is somehow democracy in action. It is not an overthrow of, of, of the U.S. Constitution, but in fact, they are pushing, and you know, it, it's not simply uh, a blue or, or democratic issue. I mean, it was attempted in the impeachment of of Bill Clinton by the Republicans. But what what has gone kind of to the ultimate extreme in this situation is that um, the Democrats, after the election of Trump, really proclaimed that he was illegitimate. But by declaring that he was illegitimate, you declare that the entirety of the Constitution and the constitutional process that actually unfolded as it should in the election of 2016 as being completely illegitimate and that something new would be put in its place. But, of course, they're saying, no, this is just a way of correcting some terrible wrong that was done. But I think everyone who is not part of their uh, emotional orbit in in the uh, incredible uh, ceremony that they are completely tracked into. I think that 
the entirety of the rest of America can see that that what they're trying to do will lead to a collapse of the constitutional order in this country, and that that any election will be instantly rendered untenable by the resistance of the losing party, which will be completely committed to overthrowing uh, whoever was elected. And this is not a possibility that can be entertained for the future. And it, it, it is literally horrifying to me and other observers that, in fact, uh, we are at this place. This, we have not been in this place before. Mike, let's let's look at the two instances we've cited as previous American civil wars. That would be the American Revolution, which is properly a civil war between one third of the colonials who supported breaking with Parliament and the King, and two thirds who were denounced as Tories, but were neither for nor against. They lived their lives and were ready to go forward without the separation from England. That instance removed the king, removed parliament, removed his authority, and did not replace it immediately. We went into a period of uh, constitutional conflict. First the Articles of Confederation, and then the thrashing around for the Constitution we now have. But that Constitution was inadequate. Hence the Second American Civil War, which removed, again, the king. Abraham Lincoln was denounced as illegitimate. The Confederacy, which had... Which found the Constitution inadequate or unnecessarily or, or poorly defended by the whole, then set up its own kingship. So we had competing kingships, Jefferson Davis and Abraham Lincoln. But really it was a way of saying we don't need a king. We're going to grow with our oligarchy. That's the South. So in those instances, when we had a genuine regicide, we don't acknowledge the legitimacy of the king. We denounce him. We denounce the whole process. Michael, what followed was a period of uninterrupted turmoil and conflict in both instances. Not stability, not peace, not going back to the way it used to be, but worse ahead. I think that's a lengthy way of saying what you just said, that we're going into a period of, or let's put it this way, historically predictable tragedy. Well, um, the the first two great civil wars, you know, one of which birthed the nation and the second of which, you know, sorted out, uh, as you said, a constitution that was no longer workable, were situations that lasted a generation each time. And th- and they didn't um, necessarily completely resolve no. the conflict. No. Um, but, but what I don't think people... And I'm I'm speaking directly to Blue here and the Democrats. I do not think that they understand what they're doing because they are creating a situation in which um, we will be effectively engaged in a civil war no matter what happens uh, because they are essentially saying that the other side is by definition, illegitimate. And, and they've chosen to, to stake out a kind of declarative position that nobody believes and nobody accepts, which is namely that this is all due to a single person, the president, and that he's ruined everything and created this abnormally crazy situation, and it must be put right by excising him. But in fact, everyone knows that that what is really happening is that they cannot accept the fact that the other party won the election legitimately. And so they will not accord the other party legitimacy, and they will do everything in their power to not only strip it of legitimacy and deny it of legitimacy, but create a situation where the the government itself cannot function. And uh, Lord only knows what will happen as an outcome to the current contretemps. We don't know, but if you have, how shall we put it, you have a 
constitution based on consensual agreement and consensual trust and commitment. And if you have opposed parties, their opposition is understood to exist within a framework in which, above all, both parties accept the legitimacy of the Constitution and of the processes that the Constitution directs and, and lays out for us, so that if there's an election, the, the, um, the outcome of the election is accepted. Both parties work together, one being in loyal opposition, one, you know, sort of ruling. Uh, and then there's an election, and that can be overturned. The uh, things can change, but that, that they work together. You're sounding sentimental, Michael. What I see today Michael. is complete conflict. You're, you're, you're talking uh, about the good old days that don't exist, Michael. Uh, right, right. Uh, right. Your language itself is out of date because yes, we're not talking about resolution. When we come back, I want to talk about what it is to hear the denunciation of the elected president of the United States by the major media in the United States and its readership. What it is to hear that from the point of view of someone who voted for the king who is to be removed. Michael Vlaos of Johns Hopkins on the eve of the beginning of the impeachment inquiry that heretofore has been a balance of for and against, but is a prosecution only, as we understand the rules in the House Majority Democratic Party. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. John Batzer, Michael Vlaeus is here. We're discussing in the context of, is this a new America civil war? On the eve of the impeachment inquiry in the House Intelligence Committee, in public, of testimony already received, pointing to the removal of the president. It's called impeachment. Old-fashioned would have been called regicide. Get rid of the king. And what will follow will not be stability and peace. That is what history says. The reason I go to this is how the two sides hear the same words. I hear impeachment as regicide. The Democrats hear impeachment as upholding the law. Those are profoundly different approaches. Both can be justified in history. I go to, in fact, a work of fiction. Michael and I have exchanged about this earlier in the day. This is George Orwell writing. Within 30 seconds, any pretense was always unnecessary. A hideous ecstasy of fear and vindictiveness, a desire to kill, to torture, to smash faces in with a sledgehammer, seemed to flow through the whole group of people like an electric current, turning one even against one's will into a grimacing, screaming lunatic. And yet the rage that one felt was an abstract, undirected emotion, which could be switched from one object to another, like the flame of a blow lamp. George Orwell, 1984, Hate Session. Why I read that passage is, in looking at, we've gone from Russiagate, which has no basis in fact, according to all testimony, to Ukraine Gate, like switching from the flame to another, like the flame of a blow lamp. Michael, it does not matter, it appears, to those who want to remove the king, what the pretense is. They're going forward in their condemnation of the king until he's gone. They're not listening to the fact that we hear this as hatred. Well, well, I think I think what what is important here, you know, if one were say an anthropologist looking at this, you know, from twenty thousand feet or a hundred miles away, what they might say looking at this that that's most important and and actually most astonishing is the fact that one group you know one half of the country blue is engaged 
an elaborate ceremonial um, called impeachment that is all for themselves. And, and this is the most important aspect, I think, is that they believe that everything they're doing is right and correct and true. Virtuous, virtuous, and, a and, claim of virtue, Michael, higher yes, virtue. Well, well, yes, and they believe that they are the only keepers of the flame. They are the only repository of true virtue uh, in the eyes of God, and th- that means that they have no capacity to understand the other, because the other, by definition, is evil and corrupt. What this means, by definition, is that the essence of the constitutional order at its core, at its existential core, has completely broken down. And nobody can see it, in large part because the... um, the activity that in our mind is associated with breakdown is military violence, and that is yet some time ahead of us. Uh, but as we understand from history, these breakdowns long precede the, the violent confrontation that follows. And so that we are in a period where um, desperate... And final decisions and choices are being made that will decide the future. And I I fear that um, the worst, because there's no way to get through uh, to the other side. And, And wherever you stand, there is no capacity to open up any kind of, uh, any kind of communication that would allow us to reclaim the now um, lapsed constitutional order. Michael, we have a minute. A year from now, we're going to have an election, is the presumption. And two possibilities, Donald Trump wins or Donald Trump loses. The third possibility is that he's removed, but we're told that's impractical in the next weeks. But that doesn't resolve anything, because if he wins, the Democrats will say, uh, we were right. He's illegitimate. If he loses, the Republicans will say, we were right. You denied the constitutional order. Both sides will dig in again and will start all right. over again with a new vocabulary. Right. No no peace. Well, I mean... 30 seconds, everyone, Michael. 30 seconds. Yeah, everyone who talks about civil war focuses on the symptoms, the violence. But the truth is, it's the irreconcilability uh, that counts. And the fact that... Um, There is no possibility for any kind of, um, you know, making up any kind of reconciliation. And so this is the path that we're on, and there is no escaping it. Michael Vlahos, Johns Hopkins, on the eve of the impeachment inquiry, so-called. I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show. City is claiming that he recently found a half-smoked joint in his Popeye's chicken sandwich. Well, at least we know the chicken was having a good time when it died. We have principles around here. We certainly do. And uh, and goals and, and, and just needs and the rest of it. But primary, one thing we never overlook is, what are you folks going to think of it? I mean, if it's the right thing to do, but it's so incredibly off-putting and off-putting and horrible that everybody tunes out, well, then that's probably not something we're going to do. Well, there's been a rash of crimes involving bums and junkies. It's become incredibly dangerous in Los Angeles, in particular, and disgusting in various uh, bummy cities around America, especially the West Coast. A woman was just attacked in Los Angeles. 
dragged out of her car, thrown into the middle of the street, and had a bucket of something poured on her. But it's so horrifying, I almost don't want to bring it to you. But this happened. This isn't made up. It's true. Here's By some homeless she, people? She says the word that we may be dancing around, but it's her It's her experience. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it was clearly a crazy person. Um, well, let's we'll just listen to her. A bucket of his diarrhea. It was liquid, hot liquid. I was soaked, and I couldn't see it was coming off of my eyelashes. It's something I won't ever forget. It was, I mean, it was disgusting. It was awful. And it changed my life. Attacked, dragged out of her car, and has a bucket. Oh, Lord. That is the worst thing I've ever heard. Of diarrhea poured upon her. God, that is awful. The man who attacked her was apprehended. This poor gal uh, already has serious PTSD uh, symptoms that they're going to have to deal with aggressively. That is so gross. And um, and obviously, immediate medical concerns. you got to get checked for all kinds oh. of things. Oh, my gosh. She, she has gotten her eyes or face. She's having monthly screens to make sure, sure. that things hadn't get, gotten into her system that shouldn't be. Right. The man who attacked yeah, her identified in court records as Jerry Blessings, G-E-R-E, was charged with battery and taken to jail. He was described as a transient with schizophrenia and psychotic disorders. We must do better. Sent by a judge to a residential facility for people with mental health issues. Um, Don't judge and those then people. Released. Don't by judge. By the way, this those happened a while back. The guy's been released. He is. He's out. Of yes. course, of course, man, man. That makes sense. That guy should be out on the street. And you're judging these people. You're prejudging these people. If you're yeah. if you're scared in your car. Or you're scared walking down the sidewalk and you look at some of these people. That says more about you than them. Right. You're judging these people. That's right. That's what the activists will tell you at your city council meeting. So just be prepared for it. Don't be cowed by it. Go ahead and respond to them. You're out of your mind. You're a crazy person. That's the single grossest thing I've ever heard in my life. And I've heard some pretty gross things. These, the uh, uh, ironically named Mr. Blessings is now back in the community, which worries the victim. She says, I will never, ever forget his face. What's the next thing he's going to do to somebody? If he would have had a knife for sure, he would have stabbed oh, yeah, me. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. This is right. This is like the uh, the San Francisco. The guy who beat down that woman outside her apartment tried to beat down the security guard gal who came out bravely to try to help. He was released the next day by a judge who said, yeah, we'll just let him go. And the district attorney in San Francisco didn't bring out his priors and his history. And there's a new, even more radical district attorney just got elected as the the people of San Francisco, at least the activist voters, turned out and doubled down. On the utopian, bum-laden, diseased policies of the recent past. So, this, so that experiment, man, that's going to go to the wall. So the guy with the bucket of D, uh, how long was he in jail? Do we have any idea? How long was he in custody? You know, that is a good question. I don't know how long he was in that mental health facility. It was two a, months. Yeah, two months. It was, it was, I was going to say about, around six weeks is what I was reading. And uh, right. do they say he's better now? or? What? Well, I don't know specifically. It's not included in this news account with a specific uh, rationale turning him loose. I suspect they got him on his meds. He was responding. He seemed fine. Right. And then, I mean, I don't I don't know the answer to the people that are mentally ill. I have no idea what you do with that. It's, it's complicated and difficult. I don't hate this guy for being schizophrenic. It's horrible. Horrible. But that doesn't mean he should be on the street. It is horrible. And grown-ups sometimes have to do things that make them sad. And that's what the utopian crowd cannot do. They cannot stomach. They don't understand that. This poor son of a bitch has a terrible disease. And he's dangerous. We need to help him with his disease and keep him from hurting people, even though it's incredibly unfortunate that he is suffering from this disease. Was he diagnosed schizophrenic? Is that oh, what yeah, he's got or? a history of terrible mental problems. Yeah. Of course, a lot of the people with the mental problems on the street, I know people like this, they have mental problems because they did so many drugs, their brain doesn't work right anymore. True. Yeah, you can give yourself schizophrenia. You can make yourself crazy. And that's what a lot of people you see on the street, I think, okay, that guy's, that person's crazy. This person's screaming at the wall or whatever. Mm-hmm. I see them every day. Every day, no exaggeration. If you if you live somewhere where you don't see that every day, this is what it's like in some parts of the country. I see people like that every day. And I think that person did so many drugs, they made themselves crazy. Mm-hmm. So now what do you do with them? There's no fixing their freaking brain. They ruined it. Right. 
don't know what you do with them. Nice uh, penal colony. Well, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta lock them up forever. Their brains are ruined. Their brains are never going to be okay. Right. Well, and again, this gets back to the sometimes adults have to do things that make them sad. You are continually choosing between honest, hardworking, law-abiding families with kids who are just trying to live their lives or the dangerous, crazy people. I know it makes you sad that the dangerous, crazy people aren't going to have happy lives living in freedom, but they can't. We've tried that. It's horrific. It's terrible. What You used the phrase. You said it's, it's difficult or whatever. It's beyond difficult. It's, it's near impossible. I don't know what we to do. To figure out the how, policies for the mental illness. How to handle, yeah. it's, it's near the impossible. Ill, yeah. I've got a child who's mentally ill. In the last 24 hours, I've been in contact with three therapists, a psychiatrist, and a medical doctor trying to take care of that with the problems that we're having. Right. Sp- with, with no limit on how much money I'm willing to spend or time I'm willing to put on it. That's for one person. How are you going to deal with these people who've got nobody? I just it's it's impossible. Yeah. I honestly don't know what the answer is, other than you've got to get them off the street for the safety of the rest of us. Mm-hmm. Unfair, sure. Well, it's I don't know what else you're going to do though. It, it's 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 sad. It's heartbreaking, but you know I don't know that it's unfair. It just and and I'm I'm more familiar than a lot of you with the sins of the past in uh, treating the mentally ill. There are a lot of sins. There are a lot of regrettable things and, and things that, well, they make you sick. But we need to keep trying. The The answer in the modern age is all this stuff is so ugly and difficult, I'm not even going to try. I am going to just let these people uh, hurt other people and themselves because I don't want to be the agent of doing something unpleasant. We, th- opening this, up the mental hospitals, the rest of it. This does add an extra layer to it, and I don't know if we've ever addressed it from this angle before on the whole mentally ill thing. Is uh, And we, get, we got several texts as soon as I brought that up from people, one of these people I know from their texting history that they have a uh, a background in this. Many people are diagnosed with schizophrenic, sch- schizophrenia due to meth use. That's a common diagnosis for people yeah. that do meth. Yeah. What do you do with somebody who made the choice in their life for whatever reason to become a meth addict? Or start doing meth. You don't choose to be an addict. I, you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to be an addict. I have an um, idea, honey. Um, but who's made themselves schizophrenic due to meth use? Yeah. How much compassion do I need to have for that person? I mean, on the Jesus level, I should have compassion for anybody who's down on their luck. What if they stab a gal? But as a society, right. do I need to allow them to be on the street at all and have any freedoms or rights at all? They need to be locked up. What's yeah. your other choice as a society? Right. You've done enough meth, you've made yourself crazy. Sorry, you're done with uh, your freedom now. And listen, i got to jump in. By locked up, we mean in a compassionate, enlightened, healthy way where they're treated. And, 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 and you know, not, not locked up like Bedlam, the infamous uh, mental asylum of, of old. Um, but, yeah, kept away from people who they could hurt. There, you know, it's funny how, how societies veer back and forth, and I've said it many times, I will continue to. Maybe I'll have them put it on my gravestone, except I don't expect to have a gravestone, just to cremate me and shoot me into space. Anyway. Okay. Um, Elon Musk, if you're listening, um, w- there are times when societies are order without compassion, and that's, you know, fascism, it's brutality. And then it veers toward, like the San Francisco model, the Seattle model, compassion without order which turns into chaos, ugliness, and people getting hurt. Um, and then it will veer back, I'm sure, at some point. But right now we're at the the uh, compassion without order stage, and it's it's horrible. It's ugly. Anyway, here's hoping you don't have a bucket of hot diarrhea poured on you today. Poor gal. Jeez, Louise, she'll be terrified of whatever disease she might have for years. That's rough. It's, um, I'd say it's rough. If anything exciting. If that ain't rough, what is? Yeah, no kidding. If anything is exciting or interesting or new has happened in the impeachment hearings, you'll hear it next on the Armstrong and Getty Show. Armstrong and Getty. Hi. 
Hi, this is Newt Gingrich. I just talked with Sarah Carter, an amazing journalist. She spent years and years studying the Mexican drug cartels. And we had a really in-depth discussion about what happened to the nine American citizens, six of whom were children, who were killed in northern Mexico. And we talked about the whole problem of drug cartels. Originally, Sarah and I were going to do this for my inner circle, which I want to invite you to join. But I thought this was so important and such a timely topic and so central to the future of the United States that I wanted to share it with everybody and let you know that this is really one of the key topics of the next few years. What are we going to do about the danger of Mexican drug cartels and the war that we're in now, both in America and in Mexico? I hope you'll enjoy the conversation with Sarah Carter. I hope you'll consider joining the inner circle, but more importantly, I hope you'll think about how this applies to what we need to do to make sure our country's safe. We're delighted to have a chance to talk with Sarah Carter, who has produced a documentary on the opioid epidemic that was just unbelievable. She is a great journalist, somebody who has been working on the whole question of the drug cartels and is extraordinarily knowledgeable. And in fact, I'm talking with her the day after she got back from Guatemala. First of all, thank you for talking with us when you must have at least a little bit of just travel exhaustion. It's great talking with you, Newt, and no worries at all. I got in late last night from Guatemala, got home about 1 a.m. after getting out of the airport and woke up early, but this is such an important issue. I'm so grateful to you for focusing on this because we see the violence and the destruction and the terror that these drug cartels have had on our society. It's incredible, and it's a global issue, but more importantly, it's a national issue for us that is basically poisoning our country and destroying the integrity of our nation. Well, you know, part of what has really sparked attention in a very big way was the killing on Monday, November 4th, about 100 miles south of the Arizona border, of at least nine U.S. citizens, including six children, two of whom I think were under one year old, members of a Mormon community in northern Mexico. The victims were in three separate cars. They were traveling back to the U.S. A couple were going to a neighboring town for a wedding, and their convoy apparently had hundreds of rounds fired at it. Some people may have been burned alive in one of the vehicles, and I think that it's a terrible tragedy which led to an awareness of how violent Mexico is getting, which is really a sad comment on our own approach. I mean, Mexico is vastly more important to us than Syria or Iraq or Afghanistan, and yet it is consistently neglected except for these kind of moments. But you've been looking at the cartels and you've been looking at the threat to the U.S. for a long time, Sarah. Can you help us understand how to contextualize this story? I'm very familiar with the area, Newt. I had traveled into that region numerous times, and then throughout my career in this particular area of Arizona, it's a battle. It's a battle between the drug cartels, particularly Sinaloa. You have the Juarez cartel. You also have Los Zetas, which is strong militia arm of the cartels that kind of became their own offshoot. They used to be a hired gun. Many of them, they believe, were former special forces of the Mexican military. And the battle wages like you can't even imagine all along this border region. We have about roughly 2,000 miles of porous border between us and Mexico. And they battle over the transit routes for their contraband, mostly for their narcotics, as well as human trafficking, as well as other types of trafficking that concern both the United States intelligence community, as well as the intelligence officials in Central America and Mexico, because these cartels will do anything to control those routes. And what they do is they battle. And it appears that this family that were just devastated by this incident and killed and the others that escaped, I can't even imagine what went through the mother's minds when this happened. There's a few things going on here, and I've talked to some sources about this. Either they were just caught in the middle of some kind of accidental shootout, mistaken identity. They could have been used as bait. That was another theory that they're looking at right now, that maybe one of the cartels, either Sinaloa, 
or somebody knew that they were heading down that road, laid out a trap for the other cartels that they were basically fighting. Now, remember, this is still very fluid. The one thing that we do know for sure is that they believe Sinaloa was involved in this. And the reason why is that several weeks ago, there were issues with Sinaloa in this region. And I'll kind of give you a little summary of how they operate. Sinaloa, when they try to target an area where they want basically to take control of the drug route from another cartel, particularly if it's Los Cetas or Juarez or something of that nature, even the Sonoran Cowboys, they will send in what they call Sinaloa assassins. They call them assassinos, same word, in Mexico. And those assassins basically go into the towns covertly. They usually rent a home from somebody who's no longer there. A lot of people have fled the border cities because of the violence. They hide out and plan their operations. This is not about little gangs operating along the border. These are militia. These are people with hundreds of millions of dollars. They have resources like you cannot imagine. In fact, when I talk to Border Patrol officials, DEA, the Drug Enforcement Agency officers, CIA that operate in those areas of the world, along with the FBI, they tell me, look, these guys have more resources than we have on the ground. They can basically listen in on our conversations. They have equipment. They have private service systems. They have ways to communicate that sometimes outsmart us. The United States is constantly trying to stay ahead of these drug cartels because of the vast amount of resources that they have. And what they do is they put these assassins inside these small border towns in these cities, and then they prepare for war. We have a war zone right next to our nation, a war zone that we now are paying attention to, but it comes at such a great cost with the lives of these nine people, these children and these women who were caught in the middle of this. Now, we don't have all the facts. We don't know exactly what happened in their case. But what I can tell you is this type of brutality happens every single day. Children are slaughtered. Women are murdered, raped, brutalized. The pictures that I've seen and the situations that I've been in don't let me sleep at night sometimes because it's so horrific. Can you imagine what this family went through and these poor little babies sitting in the back of the car in their car seat. I have been in situations where I've talked to sources that have told me children are definitely a target for them, especially inside Mexico, inside Central America, when they have a rat among them. That means somebody that basically is working or cooperating with law enforcement or federal officials with the cartels. They'll definitely target the children first and their wives to send a message to everyone else, you don't say anything. Now, that's separate from this incident, what happened here. I'm not saying that at all, that this family was at all involved in anything like that. What I am saying is that these people are brutal murderers. They are terrorists. What we've seen in Syria, Newt, what we've seen with ISIS, when Islamic State, you know, would put these videos up, of torturing people and torturing our journalists and beheading them. This has been going on right next door to us in Mexico for decades, and it's only gotten worse. Remember, the purpose of terrorism is to terrify. And so if you want to terrify people, you do terrifying things. I want to toss an idea at you, though. I thought about all this, and and I've obviously been involved off and on for a very long time, and I've watched it get worse. The estimate right now is that according to ICE, that somewhere between $19 billion and $29 billion a year leaves the United States to finance the cartels. So to give you an example, the city of San Francisco last year gave away 5,800,000 needles. Now, what was the value to the cartel of the drugs which were bought to fill the needles? The central front in defeating the cartels is the United States, not Mexico. As long as we're determined to buy drugs, the new generation of terrorists and thugs and gangsters will grow up, and we can kill the old generation. And what will happen over time is we'll kill all the ones who are dumb, and the ones who are left really will be smarter and harder. I think this is a useful moment to get the American people to realize that since 2006, there have been at least 150,000 people killed by organized crime in Mexico. There's an average, I think, of one journalist a month being killed. 
There were 37 mayors and candidates for mayor last year who were killed. We're on the edge of having Lebanon or Syria on our border with a country which is much bigger in population. We're also in danger of the cartels deciding that they can be violent in the United States. And the morning that starts to happen, we are in a real nightmare. That's it. You said it so well, Newt, because it really is at our doorstep. It really is here. And I would suggest that here at our border, we have a narco state. And the reason why President Lopez Obrador is so lax in his ability to target these drug cartels, saying we want to do it through peace, we don't need a war, it's going to be worse, it's not going to be worse. The problem is, is that there are so many people within the government of Mexico, and I would even say here in the United States, we've seen it happen, where the drug cartels have been able to buy off some of our federal law enforcement officers or blackmail them because the billions of dollars that they have gives them the capability to do things we can't even imagine, right? These are the worst of the worst people, and they could care less about our country. Right now, Sinaloa is actually manufacturing their own fentanyl. They're not even bothering with China anymore. They want to make the money off of fentanyl. And when you think about Lopez Obrador not taking the offer from President Trump saying, look, work with us. Let us work with you. Let's declare war on the cartels right now. Let's do it. Let's take them out. And he backs away from it. You have to ask yourself, is he under threat? What's going on with Lopez Obrador? How much influence happened in Mexico and how much influence happens in Mexico continuously by these drug cartels with their government, with their federal officials, with their Mexican military? I'll tell you a short little story that really opened my eyes. And it was back in 2006. I was a younger reporter. I was over there and I was interviewing some people in Nuevo Laredo. And this was after the biggest gun battles happened in Nuevo Laredo. I mean, it was still ongoing. The, the Mexican federal officials that were sent there, I think at that time by Vincente Fox, basically stayed there for one day, and then they split because they were so terrified of Los Zetas and the Sinaloa fighting in that region. And I asked one of the officers, who I'm sure was in the pocket of Los Zetas, one of the Mexican officials there in, in Nuevo Laredo, I said to him, what is going on here? Where's the military? He goes, you know what? In, here in Mexico, what we say is when you get a good retirement plan is when the Mexican military sends you to the border. Because at that point, you're not just getting paid by the state, you're getting paid by the drug cartel. So imagine what we're up against. The difficulty for our nation to basically work with Mexico in targeting these cartels. I know there's so many good people in Mexico, too. I'm not saying there isn't. There are so many people that have given their lives in this fight against the narco traffickers, Mexican officials, Mexican citizens, Mexican journalists. But when a majority or a good handful of people with power are taking money or they're being blackmailed or they're being threatened, then we have something to worry about. And that's what we need to be thinking about is how do we save our nation, work with our partner next door, find a common solution. But when their government doesn't want to work with us, what's our next step? I would argue that de Blasio is at least as soft on crime as the president of Mexico, and that you have judges around the country who are basically owned by the gangs, particularly in cities. We have a lot of cleaning up to do here. That's right. And we, when you think about what's happening in New York, as compared to what New York was and the changes that were made by Rudy Giuliani, and you see what's happening now, and people are saying crime is surging again in certain areas of New York City. We've got judges here who appear to be on the take, and we have young Americans dying every single day. Look at Chicago. It's a bloodbath there. It's a dual bloodbath because you have young Americans dying from the drug addiction when 91% of the heroin coming into the United States comes from Mexico. You look at the opiates, you look at the fentanyl. We lose more people annually than we lost in the entire Vietnam War. And we need to take it really, really seriously. I think this is a particularly timely moment. I can't tell you how grateful I am that you would take this time immediately after being in Guatemala. You're one of the unsung heroes of America's recovery. I think it's really, really important what you've been doing. 
Oh, thank you so much, Newt. It means a lot to me. I mean, this is about my children, too. It's about all of our children. And more importantly, it's about the future of our nation. And we have to be willing to fight for something. The way we're going to win this war is by all of us, parents, mothers, siblings, everyone, getting together and just saying, no more. We're not going to take it. We're going to find a solution. And it's going to be a tough one, but we're going to stand up to the drug cartels, and we're not going to allow them to kill our children anymore. If you found this discussion informative and you'd like to hear more, please go to NewtsInnerCircle.com and become a member of Newt's Inner Circle today. The first 500 yearly subscribers will receive a limited edition gift as part of their Newt's Inner Circle membership. Join Newt's Inner Circle today. Go to NewtsInnerCircle.com and enter the code NEWT10 to get 10% off your membership.